Hey everybody, thank you for joining us today. We pray that this message reaches you wherever you are at today in whatever situation you are facing. We pray that the Lord ministers to your life. Hang on till the end, and I want to say a couple more things to you before we're done. Amen. Would you stand this morning? If you've got your Bibles, turn to Romans chapter 6. I know this is kind of backwards as far as probably preaching about it and doing it. We wanted to baptize people in the middle so we have plenty of time. But I'm actually going to talk about baptism this morning. And I want to talk from this topic, washed in the water. Washed in the water. Romans chapter 6, verse 1. Did you come ready to receive the word of the Lord this morning? Amen. Amen. Verse 1 says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we also shall live with him. Knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in its lust. And, and do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. Father, we thank you for your word today. Thank you that your word changes us. And Father, today, as we hear your word, I just pray that a seed goes forth. That Father, somebody came in here today, walked in with some bondage, and they're going to walk out with the chains off of their life today. So Father, just bless this time. Thank you for your anointing. In Jesus' name we pray. By the power of the Holy Spirit, we ask all these things. And all God's people together said, Amen. Amen. Turn around and high five somebody and say, I'm glad I get to sit by you and you may be seated. I want to jump right into our text this morning and go over a few things. Romans chapter 5, um, the book of Romans, to me, the, the letter of Romans, is this beautiful account of what it means to be redeemed and changed. And Chapter 5 is this glorious account of what it means for God to set us free. The Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 5, he says, Through one man's disobedience, that was Adam, through one man's disobedience, we all sinned. Sin enters the world. So we all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But he doesn't stop there. That sounds kind of hopeless. He goes on to say, but through one man's obedience, Jesus, the second Adam, through Jesus, the second Adam's obedience, all are made alive. We have a chance to know him. We have been redeemed. And the word out of chapter 5 is justified. You have been justified. That is just as if I had never sinned. I have been changed. I have been transformed. I have been justified. And then Romans 5, toward the end, he says this, and I love this line. It's always one of my favorite lines out of chapter 5. He says, where sin abounds, grace doth much more abound. Where sin abounds, grace abounds even more. Aren't you glad today that where sin abounds, grace is even greater than our sin? That the grace of God, the goodness of God abounds greater than our sinfulness. And so Paul says where sin abounds, grace abounds even more. And then he writes chapter 6. Now understand something. We, We understand the Bible kind of in our Western framework of chapters and verses. 
And if you've ever come to our Wednesday night, we're doing the, a study of Ephesians right now. I've told you many times that these were letters that were written to churches. And they would have sat in one setting and read the entire letter. Now, I will tell you this. There's, there's a lot of us wouldn't sit through reading the entire book of Romans at one time. Some of you about to go to sleep right now. We ain't been here an hour yet. And so the book of Romans, they would have sat there and read all that. But to make it easier for people to read, they added chapters and verses. So now it doesn't say start at the, the, the front of the letter and I'll see you at the end. We can say go to chapter 5 or go to chapter 6 in this verse. And so Paul is writing chapter 6, but it's a letter. He's writing continuously. He didn't stop. He's writing this thought. And so at the end of chapter 5, he says where sin abounds, he uses that word abounds, grace doth much more abound. And then Romans 6 says, what shall we say? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Uses that same word. In other words, we know that grace abounds, greater than sin. But should I keep sinning just because grace is there? Should I keep sinning just because we know God forgives us and His grace is there? And Paul is trying to say that grace is not a license to sin. That grace is not my ability to say, you know what, I'll live however I want because God's grace is there. Who cares? At the end of the day, God will forgive me, so I'm going to live however I want. And Paul says this, should we continue in sin that grace shall abound? And then he says this in the King James, it says, God forbid. The New King James says, certainly not. In other words, I don't keep sinning just because grace is available. I don't keep living that way. It's the idea that Paul says in Galatians Chapter 2, he says, I do not frustrate the grace of God. You know what I believe frustrates the grace of God? When I feel like I can live however I want and it doesn't matter because God's grace is there. Is God's grace available? You bet it is. But I don't believe that I live however I want because of that. I believe that I live differently because of the grace of God. I believe the great grace of God was given so that I could live differently. And here's the thing. So Paul uses this image of baptism to explain it to us. What does that look like? How do we walk that out? And he uses the image of baptism. Paul understands as we do that baptism is not what saves us. It is, the, it is belief in Christ. It is the saving knowledge. Romans 10, 9 and 10. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. It is the confession of who God is. It is believing in him. He will, he will save us. He will transform us. But baptism is something that we do to say I, it is a symbol of an outward sign that God has changed me and God has redeemed me and God has set me free. And so because of that... Listen, I believe this, I can prove it to you scripturally, that if you are at the end of your life on your deathbed and that you confess Jesus and he saves you, you will go to heaven. The thief on the cross, he's on the cross, he says, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said, today, surely you shall be with me in paradise. The thief didn't have time to get off the cross, go get baptized, get back on the cross and die before he left this world. But here's the thing, just because that is the possibility doesn't mean it's how I believe God has set everything up. I do believe he calls us to follow him in baptism. And I believe if we're able, we are commanded to be baptized. Matthew 28, go into all the world and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit. We believe that baptism is more than just something I do to get dunked in water. We believe that baptism is something to show the world that I have decided to follow Jesus. But I also believe there's a deeper meaning. I believe when I go under those waters, just as Jesus was baptized, just like Jesus went into the grave and came up to newness of life, I I am going under the water and I am being washed. I recognize I have been washed. I have been cleansed. And because of that, I am being raised to a newness of life. Amen. Amen. The word baptism here is the word in the Greek, baptizo. And baptizo, in the ancient world, people would have recognized this meaning. To be baptized, it literally meant this. In, in their meaning, it meant two things. It meant to dip and to die. Not D-I-E, but D-Y-E. Because they had fabrics, they wanted to be a certain color. Unlike today where they had all the technology, they would take a fabric and they say, you know what, I think this thing would look better if it was blue. And so they would take dye and they would dip a fabric in the dye. 
And when they dipped the fabric in the dye, they left it long enough and they pulled the fabric out and that fabric would get dried and then they could wear it. It was dipped and it was dyed. It went in one way and it came out something else. It went in one way, but after it was dipped and dyed, it came out something else different it had been transformed and you know what Paul says in Romans 3 or 6 verse 3 do you not know as many of us were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death baptizo as many of us as were dipped and died into Christ Jesus we have been dipped and died into his death and here's the thing when you go under the water you are being dipped but you know what you're also being died not with just anything you are being died with the precious blood of the lamb the precious blood of a spotless lamb the same one that John says behold the lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world you have been dipped and you have been dyed you go in one way and you come out something else because we recognize it is not the water that changes me but it is the blood of Jesus that sets me free and transforms me but I am symbolically saying I am a new creation in Jesus Christ Christ. Amen. Amen. So how do we live that way? Three things quickly. Number one, you must recognize you are dead. You are dead. You are dead. Paul says in in Colossians, you are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. When you begin to realize that, you begin to realize that going under the water symbolizes that my old man is crucified. Pastor Tony Evans tells a story about a man that went to a nutritionist one day to a dietitian and said, I've got a problem with my diet. When I go to the grocery store, I'm attracted to the dog food section. And I just show up, and whatever reason, it's like I make a beeline to the dog food. And I'm looking at it, and I'm, I'm panting, looking at the dog food. And I'm watching, I'm looking at these dogs on the dog food, and all I can think is I want to be running and playing with them. And then, if I'm not careful, I will rip open that dog food and get a big old scoop and eat it right there. And then he says, if I get too excited, I'll lay on the ground barking and howling and try to get somebody to rub my belly right there in the middle of the grocery store. I need help. And the dietician said, I don't think there's something wrong with your diet. I think it's different than that. How long have you been doing this? And the guy said, since I was a puppy. And Tony Evans goes on to say this. He says, you, and sometimes in life, you don't need behavior modification. You need a new identity. And I'm telling you this, there's some people that think that Christianity is behavior modification. That Jesus came to make me a, a better me. Listen, he didn't come to make you a better you. He came to make the dead you alive. He came to make you a new you. He came to make you a new creation. He didn't come just to make you a better version of your old self. He came to make you a new creation. You are dead. You've got to realize my old man has been crucified. And when I go under the water, Paul says you are dead with Christ. And understand that some of you, the problem is your old man still talks to you. And you think dead people can talk and I got good news for you when they're good and dead they can't say anything quit listening to your old man quit listening to your old self realize that old self is dead it has no dominion over me because it is dead and I am dead with Christ amen and then number two Paul says this he says you have been set free from sin not only are you dead but you have been set free sin doesn't have to reign in your mortal body. I know what people say, well, pastor, I'm not perfect. Listen, I know none of us are perfect, but that doesn't give you the reason to say, you know what, I'm not perfect. Many times we use that as an excuse to live however we want. There was some guys got up this morning, maybe some ladies too, I'm sure, got up this morning and went to this thing called a deer stand early this morning, and they had a bow and arrow in their hand, and they're looking for a deer. Now, most of them, I would say, there's always one weirdo in a bunch, but Most of them would say, my goal, if I see a deer and I can kill it, my goal is to hit the deer and not miss, okay? Maybe there's one weirdo who just says, I don't really care. But most people say, my goal, my aim is to kill that deer. I may miss, but that's not my aim. My aim is to take down that deer. 
And here's the problem. I understand that we're not perfect. But the problem with many of us is we don't understand that your aim is to be like Jesus. Your aim should be to live a life where sin doesn't dominate you any longer. That's your aim. There are times you miss the mark. All of us do. And that's why grace and mercy is available. But you've got to realize our aim is not to live however I want. Sin is not my aim. Victory is my aim. Victory over sin is my aim. Freedom is my aim. And there are times I miss the mark, but I continue to shoot my arrow toward the aim of knowing Jesus in greater ways and being set free. You have been set free in Jesus. Amen? That means, number one, you have been set free from the penalty of sin. That Jesus, 2,000 years ago, paid a debt that you could not pay. 2,000 years ago, he paid a price for you. He paid the penalty. And you aren't good enough. You can't give enough money. You can keep trying if you want. We'll take it just to see what happens. But the truth is, you can't give enough. You can't be good enough. You don't have enough degrees behind your name to pay for your sins. But 2,000 years ago, Jesus defeated death, hell, and the grave. He conquered it. He made a display openly of sin and of the devil he nailed it to the cross and he died for our sins and three days later he got up out of the grave and he walked out of there and because of that we have been set free from the penalty of sin amen number two you've been set free from the power of sin once again sin doesn't have to reign in your mortal body I'm not talking about one of these days I'll get to that in just a minute People read this and say, well, yeah, one of these days I'm going to live the resurrection with Jesus in the sweet by and by. No, Paul says in your mortal bodies. In the body you got right now, sin doesn't have to reign. That's why the Holy Spirit was given, to give you power over sin. The Holy Spirit was given so that you could have power and victory over sin. I can live a victorious life because Jesus gave me the Holy Spirit. And I understand the world is full of all kinds of things. But greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Because I have the Holy Spirit, the greatest power in the universe, living on the inside of me. And because of that, I've been set free from the penalty of sin. And I've been set free from the power of sin. And one of these days, our hope is, we know the reason we keep going is because one of these days... We will be set free from the presence of sin. That is our hope. One of these days we're going to see him and we're going to be like him for we're going to see him as he is and the presence of sin will be totally destroyed. Death will be destroyed and the presence of sin will be no more. But until that day comes, I can still live knowing that I have been free from the penalty of sin and I have been free from the power of sin. Amen? Amen. And then number three, not only are you dead, And not only have you been set free from sin, but number three, you have been made alive. You've been made alive. Here's what I want you to see with that. That God created you for a purpose and a reason. And and he created you so that you could understand why he put you on this earth. God didn't put you here to suck air and to pay taxes and to die one day. I worked with a guy one time that it was like, Literally, all he lived for was just to go through the day, get home, sit in an easy chair, watch a little television, and get up in the next day and do it all over again. And it was day and day of his life, in many ways, meaningless. And one of the saddest things to me is people who haven't realized God set you free for a reason. He created you for a purpose and a destiny. He made you alive. And he made you alive so that you could make a difference, so that you could live for him. And the problem with a lot of us is this. We're like Lazarus. You know, Lazarus is in the tomb. One of my favorite phrases in the King James, Jesus says, roll away the stone. And the sister says, Jesus, surely by now he stinketh. I've used that over a lot of things in my life, a lot of things. Surely by now he stinketh. And Jesus says, Lazarus, come forth. And he's alive. He's made alive. But you know how he comes out of the grave? Hopping. You know how I know? Because he's got grave clothes still on him. He's alive, but he's got some grave clothes. And Jesus says next, loose him and let him go. And the problem is with a lot of us is this. We have been made alive, 
but we're still carrying the grave clothes. We're still holding on to some things. And God wants to set you free and let you know he made you alive so that you could have purpose and destiny, that you could be fulfilled in your life. I, I'm a child of the 90s, okay? I grew up, I was born in 1980. So I'm a child of the 90s, and the 90s shaped me. And some of you had different kinds of music, and I grew up in a household. We listened to Southern Gospel music and then CCM when it came along. i never forget the, one, the first time a guy at my church gave me a DC talk tape. It was one that he had, um, you know, like a, almost like a burn CD. He had made it for me and it was like a drug deal going down in church. He's like passing this, this, this tape to me. I take it home. My dad, my parents aren't around. I listen to DC talk and my dad said, boy, what are you listening to in there? I said, dad is Christian. I promise. We had to, back then we didn't know anything about that kind of stuff. But I also grew up and some of you had Elvis. Some of you had the Beatles. Some of you had, I don't know, whoever, you know, Eagles, whatever, you 70 folks like, whatever. But just kidding. I had Nirvana. <laughs> Smelled like teen spirit. Kurt Cobain was a man who, whether he, he never realized it, but I believe God actually gifted him. He was gifted to write music and to play. But I'll never forget the day I was coming home from school. I, was, I believe I was, I don't know, in, in junior high. I'm riding home with my parents, and um, the radio, come across the radio, that Kurt Cobain has taken his own life. And Kurt Cobain, in his own admission, before he did that, he said, I had everything the world could offer me. I had all the money, sex, ro drugs, rock and roll women whenever I wanted anything I wanted it's not like, like Solomon anything my eyes desired I had it Kurt Cobain would say I had anything that I wanted but at the end of the day there was a hole inside of me that the stuff couldn't feel I tried it all but I had no joy and I had no peace and he left this earth unfortunately sadly saying I'm empty because I have nothing but I want you to know something, that I believe the only thing that can really satisfy, the only thing that can fill that hole in your life is not stuff. You'll never find enough stuff to do it, but it's a man named Jesus. He is the only one that can give you peace and joy. He's the only one that can really satisfy that longing inside of you. And I want you to know you have been made alive for a reason. He made you alive so that you can live with peace and joy and make a difference so that you could realize today that as you've gone under the water and you come out of those waters you have a new purpose and a new reason to live I'm almost done we're gonna pray but here's the thing we're gonna pray in a few moments for some of you that walked in here with some grave clothes and you need to be set free we're gonna lay hands on you and pray for you but I also want to tell you this last service after I got done preaching my message I opened it back up for anybody to spontaneously be baptized. We've got towels for you. We've got shirts for you. You have to wear your own pants. I'm sorry about that. You can't go without those. But, um, but you can wrap the towel around you, take it home with you, and keep it forever. And we had six people walk out of the audience and come and get baptized spontaneously at the end of the service. We're going to do the same thing in a few moments. Pastor Wesley's going to be over here. And this morning, if you recognize there's something in me, I need to go under that water. I need to recognize, listen, some people say we got to go through a class and all that kind of stuff. The Bible says that the Ethiopian eunuch was there and he talked to Philip and he, and he said, I don't know what's going on. And Philip said, you're reading Isaiah. And he explained to him the scriptures. And, and, and the Ethiopian eunuch asked him a question, what is holding me back from being baptized right now? And they pulled over to the side of the road and they got out in a little puddle right there, whatever it was. And he baptized him on the spot. So this morning, if you say, you know what, I need to recognize in my life that I need that kind of freedom, we're going to offer you that. But also this morning, there's some of you, you just need to let some things go. You've been holding on. And Jesus wants you to know this morning what Paul tells us, you are buried in baptism with Christ, but you have been raised to a new life. You're not the same person you used to be. Quit making that your identity and realize you have a new identity in Jesus. Would you stand to your feet this morning?
Hey everybody, thank you so much. We are so honored that you chose to join us today for this message. And our prayer is for you and your family that you would be uplifted and encouraged. If today you receive Christ or if you would like to give to the vision of Landmark Church, if you would go to our website, www.landmarkchurchok.com, there's more information there, how you can do all of that. And also if you have a prayer request, please let us know how we can be praying for you guys. We love you and hope you have a blessed time.